So today we'll talk about differentiation of vectors. I'm going to take a guess of what comes to mind when you hear the derivative of a vector. So here's what probably comes to mind. And don't even lie and say that's not what comes to mind. You think of this as a vector-valued function. And then if somebody says the derivative of a vector-valued function, you think of this. Okay, how many of you agree with that statement that that's what you think of? That's right. So, thank you. I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> so, my goal for today's class, and actually my goal in life, is to have you think of a totally different thing. And that's to treat geometric vectors on their own terms. Geometric vectors have everything you need to take derivatives of them of a vector-valued function, of a geometric vector-valued function, like this, u, geometric vector of t. So we'll talk about what this means and what it means to take a derivative of it. And you'll just see that, logically speaking, it's a very, very clean framework. Remember, part of the reason we like geometric vectors, other than the fact that they allow us to preserve geometry while employing algebraic ideas, which is tremendous, right? Another thing, maybe it's a side effect of what's wonderful about geometric vectors, is that there are so few things you can do with them. You can only add them, multiply by numbers, and dot multiply. You can only do three things with them, right? And the fewer things you do, uh, the fewer things are possible, the easier it is to work with these objects, because there are fewer options to choose from. It just really simplifies the framework, streamlines your thinking, and just makes for just a, a very elegant, once again, that same word, a very elegant framework that's just so enjoyable to work with. So let's first think about it algebraically. Algebraically. Remember the definition of the derivative. That's what we're going to do. We're going to remember the definition of the derivative as a limiting process. And then we'll realize that uh, all of that is possible to do with geometric vectors as is, on their own terms, without thinking of them as triplets of numbers, which we haven't done yet and won't do for another couple of weeks. Uh, good. Okay, so what's the definition of a derivative? Derivative of a function is the limit as h goes to zero. I apologize for your calculus PTSD if you're currently experiencing it, but I promise you this will be okay, of f of x plus h, right? You give x a little increment and you evaluate f at that new nearby point and you subtract the value of the function at the original point and you divide it by the increment and then you see what happens to this ratio as the increment becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And the limit, uh, whatever it is, we could talk about how a limit is simpler than what you learned in high school with epsilons and deltas, which is really a distraction from the pure idea. But in any case, that all of this is possible to do just with geometric vectors. So let's point that out. And then we'll talk about just what does this function really mean and how do we visualize it and what's the point of a, of a vector-valued function. Now realize the taxonomy of things. The argument is just a simple real number. So for as t changes, or maybe x, whatever you want to call it, we just keep getting a new vector u every time. So a function, you can think of it as a mapping or a black box. You give it a variable a value for the variable, it gives you back the value of the function. So here, you give it a number, and it gives you back a vector. And you give it another number, and it gives you back another vector. And you can put in uh, a number and then a nearby number that differs from it by just a small value h, and it'll give you, hopefully, a slightly different vector. What we'll never see is something like this where the argument is a vector. Now you could absolutely think of something like this. Taxonomy-wise, it works. You give it a vector, it gives you back a number. 
you give it another vector, it gives you back another number, and so on. But you will see why we would have a very hard time defining the derivative of this. So you'll see that in a moment. So this is something we won't consider, and this is something that we will consider. Okay, and you'll see why. Okay, so what does it take to evaluate the derivative according to this way of thinking? Well, what are, the, what are the elements that we have here? We have to be able to evaluate a function at a certain number, which we can do with a function like this. You give it a number, it gives you back a vector. You give it another number, it gives you back another vector. Maybe it would be helpful if I gave you an example of a vector-valued function. Well, why don't I do that? Don't specifically think of that one, but how about a function like this? Uh, you give me alpha, and I give you back the vector that corresponds to the angle alpha. That's a vector. If I give you pi, you'll say your answer is this vector. Not a pair of numbers. Don't think of it that way. This geometric arrow. You, you say 3 pi over 2, and I'll say, well, your answer is this vector. This arrow, right? Not a pair of numbers. Get that out of your head. Okay. I say zero, it's this vector. So that's an example of a vector-valued function. Very geometric one, but it doesn't have to be so nicely geometric. It can just be a black box. A number goes in, a vector comes out. So you have to be able to evaluate the function, check. Evaluate it at a nearby value, why not? Subtract one value from the other. Are we able to do that with geometric vectors? Absolutely. Right? It's kind of nice how the very few things that we can do with geometric vectors, each has a place here, right? So there are very few things that we can do with geometric vectors, but each one of them is essential to this definition. Then can we divide a vector by a number h? Absolutely, that's something you can do with vectors. And so now you get sort of like another function. This becomes like a function u of h, right? Because at any given point, x, if you think of that as fixed and h is variable, when you evaluate this ratio, well, you keep getting a new vector each time. We'll see an example of that. Okay, and now you have to say, is it going to a particular limit? Can vector-valued functions approach a limit? What would we need for that? Well, the intuitive idea of a limit is that you're getting closer and closer and closer and closer to a particular value. So do vectors have the concept of closer and closer and closer? Like, how would you say that these two vectors are close and these two vectors are not close? Well, it's the distance between their tips. So this vector and this vector are close. Why? Because their difference is very short. We can find their difference. We can find the length of their difference. And we can... Uh, say whether the distance goes to zero. So that's what it means for a vector-valued function to approach a particular limit. It just means that as this vector varies, its distance to its limit, so I might say this is capital U, zero, equals the limit of a function as h approaches zero. If the distance, the length of the difference, that's what distance is, it's the length of the difference between this function and the constant value, the limiting value, approaches zero, which is just an ordinary concept with numbers because distance is a number and we understand those limits from ordinary calculus. So vector-valued functions, vectors, you can talk about a sequence of vectors approaching a limit or you can talk about a vector function approaching a limit at any value, but also as h approaches zero. So, uh, this kind of object, geometric vector, that we can do so little with, gives us just enough to evaluate derivatives. Okay? So let's talk about what that derivative might look like and the interpretation of the derivative, just like an ordinary calculus, we talk about the interpretation of the derivative, and it's pretty artificial if you think about it. You need to draw orthogonal coordinate axes, you need to plot the function in Cartesian coordinates, 
you need to draw the tangent line and talk about the slope of that function, there's a lot. It's not direct what the geometric interpretation is. You have to build it up. There's quite a bit to build up. With us, in this particular situation, uh, I'm not saying it's more fundamental, because that's pretty fundamental. It's just a little bit more direct. The geometric interpretation will just be there for the taking. So let's talk about that. But first we need to talk about, well, what's the interpretation of a vector-valued function? And the answer after I erase the board.